Welcome to the WebLogic Build Pack for Cloud Foundry. This WebLogic Build Pack is now a public GitHub project that allows users to natively run WebLogic applications on Cloud Foundry platform. This is a fork of the Java Build Pack. The key features are it installs and configures a single server WebLogic domain and deploys the applications. It also creates certain supporting artifacts like data sources, JMS subsystems, and also conf configures the heap and other JVM settings for the server based on configurations that are bundled with the app. It's quite possible for the application or the build pack to override the domain configurations. Uh, the build pack also allows uh, option to run in limited footprint mode, which is called the WLX option, wherein there is no support for JMS, EJB, or JCA. The build pack also allows a lot of fine tuning options wherein service bindings that are exposed from Cloud, Found Cloud Foundry service brokers can then be used to create data sources underneath the covers. So, this is the structure of the WebLogic application. The build pack looks for a .wls folder at the root of the application. The .wls folder indicates that this needs to be used by the WebLogic build pack to create a WebLogic domain and within the root of .wls there is a configuration file called it, that configuration file is used to name and control the domain instance that would be created the name of the domain the name of the server instance the credentials for the server would be all configured by the domain config there can be other configurations files all these are in yaml they can be used for configuring the data sources or JMS or foreign JMS services. Let's take a quick look at the config files. So what we are going to look is first the domain config file. So the domain config file has a domain entry and it has a server name, the domain name, the WebLogic credentials and it also allows you the option of enabling the console or not and uh, there is also an option to enable production mode for WebLogic server. We can also see that uh, there are additional configurations for JDBC or JMS. Let's take a look at JMS. Uh, okay, right now for the heap, if one can configure the different heap settings like min and max heap size, one can specify the initial and maximum permanent generation sizes. One can also provide other JVM flags like our print or turn on robust GC logging where the log file should go whether uh, to print with timestamps or uh, any other additional arguments, command line arguments that needs to be passed to the server. So this .wls folder is expected either inside a var or jar or ef file. So the end deployment unit can be a var file or a web app, a web app or a jar or a ear. Let's take a look at the JMS configuration. So you can configure a JMS server with different queues and topics. You can also configure, configure the connection factories, which can be XA or non-XA. These would all get targeted to the JMS server residing within the single server instance of the domain. You can also configure data sources. You can configure the driver, the URL, the endpoints, the pool properties like a max and unit capacity. You can configure the test pool name or whether it needs to be XA or non-XA. You can also use multi-data source configuration wherein you are going against a rack that provides high availability. You can select the multi-pool algorithm as a load balancing or failover. All of these are provided as templates. One can edit it as required and override the configurations or create multiple copies in case of configurations like JD, JM, JDBC data sources. In addition to this, the build pack would try to parse the environment variables that are coming into the server instance, which can carry information about service bindings. Those would be used to create data sources that point to the Cloud Foundry managed services or user managed services. It can be JMS or JDBC. So this is an this was an example of foreign JMS providers.
uh, let's look at the contents of the EF file. So we see there are two web apps within the EF file. If we do the tar tvf of the year, we should see the .wls folder. It has our was and it has the .wls folder with all these configurations built in. So the build pack would pass these to come up with the domain structure. And there is also a script that needs to be used for WLST. WLST is a scripting tool used within WebLogic to create domains or configure and manage domains. So it, the script that is bundled within the app or the build pack would be allowed to use the configurations and parameters that are passed along with the app to create the final end domain. So it, from the YAML files, they are converted into property files and used by WLST to create the domain. The users, uh, the customers can actually tweak these scripts uh, as per the requirements to enable or override or change things. So coming to the build pack, the build pack first and foremost is we need to push the build packs to the server. We can, there are two options for pushing the build pack. You can say create build pack and point it to a zip file or you can point it to a GitHub repository while you are doing the push of the apps. So now we are deleting the build pack. Uh, we saw that earlier it was enabled and it or had a precedence or position of one which means that any app that gets pushed to the cloud foundry platform would be used would be first run against server project build pack rather than uh, the default build packs the system build default build packs always use tomcat as a default app server for java if you push the web project build pack then this one would take precedence over the other default Java build packs. So now we have pushed the build pack, we have set it to one, the portion of one, we can see it is getting listed. Now let's do the app push. So while pushing the app, ensure that you are specifying the path to the EF file using minus P option and also specify the total memory footprint or the native memory footprint for the application, which, near, which I strongly recommend to set it to be like one gig. Essentially, WebLogic server always uses a larger fo footprint compared to like other servers like Tomcat. So it's uh, much safer and sa it's safer and best practice to at least give one gig just to be on the safer side. So the minus M option provides a max native footprint that can be used by the app when running within the warden containers of Cloud Foundry platform. So now that we are pushing the app, we can see that it is uploading the app bits. The next one would be to download the JDK and the WebLogic binaries from a user-defined repository location you can see there is a 1211 address that was configured with the WebLogic build pack to download the app bits. You can run this various stages that the build pack does offline without testing it against Cloud Foundry directly by running the detect first. Detect would provide a status if it finds that it is of uh, it is compatible with WebLogic. The compile is the stage where it installs subbits and then creates a domain based on the configurations that are bundled within the application or the build pack. And the final stage is a release where it displays the JVM arguments and the command line arguments and the final executable that needs to be run in most cases. So for WebLogic it would be the start WebLogic command. So now let's look at what's happening within the DA container. So the DA instance is showing that the build pack has started creating the domain using the Python script. You can see there's a WebLogic WLST going on. 
previous to this the WebOgic build pack started installing the bits it ran the configure which would uh, set up the scripts and the JVM path and everything else while this one this last step is for the domain creation so now that the domain has been created the the droplet content has been created it's basically a tarball of the whole install of the JDK the web logic and the domain along with the application that is created as a tarball and uploaded to the Cloud Foundry controller. So now uploading droplet is happening for a 525 MB size. So this droplet includes the WebLogic install, so it is quite big. And uh, the default CF, the previous versions of CF releases had a limitation wherein uh, they were always setting it to max droplet size of 256 MB. You can see currently the staging is completed and now we are going on to the extraction part of the stage bits so the droplet would extract the stage bits and start executing and now you can see the java command has started you can see our project server has been kicked off so now the on the left hand side we can see the logs the sea of logs is kind of tailing on the project server logs they're using the log creator functionality and we can see the server has started and uh, we got the status as running when you click on the link we can see it loads as an index page which shows the uh, service the server information of the server host port other environment variables we can see under the vcap application properties there will be instant index so we highlighted the server port and the vcap index the instance index is zero which essentially means this is the very first instance for the app running on the server and the other thing is uh, we can also access console because we have allowed console access to be enabled so we can actually hit the WebLogic server admin console so this takes us to the admin console page this is all from the same endpoint as we published the app on Cloud Foundry so now this is accessing the console in the meantime we can also see on the left hand side we have the app slash zero which indicates that this is app instance zero or the very first instance and let's try to do a scale up of the web project server instance right now it is just running with one instance we want to scale up top to two this would essentially kick off a new container with the same app bits that were staged previously and it would kick, get executed as a new server instance so now we have uh, said to scale it up to two in a short moment we should see on this left hand side the log uh, log aggregator picking up the log tracing for the server instance 2 so now we can see the admin console from stay instance 1 we can see the deployments deployment had two web apps one with the root context and the other with the sample web 2 and we can see also the services we can see the database the jdbc data sources okay coming to the left side we can see app 1 is coming up which is the actual second instance of the project server now if we list the CFR instances <coughs> we can see two <coughs> excuse me so if we either refresh or open it one more tab we can see it is changing the background from green to blue the green is for instance index 0 while blue is for instance index 1 and we can also see the ports are different 19 for the second one versus 17 for the first one and the same way the addresses are also different so this shows two web logic server instances running with the same exact configurations each having their own console and memory and everything now if we scale it up further the third one would use a color of red for background just to show it is a different instance so refreshing like I don't I have turned off session session so it is bouncing back between 
zero and one. So now when we did the scale up to three, the app slash two has come up. And if we go back to the browser, the two is still coming up. Okay, the third instance is up and running. Let's check it. So it is green and blue. Okay, now we got the red and the port is on 21 and instance index is two. So we have got now three instances of WebLogic server scaled up simply using CF scale command. Uh, one thing to notice any changes that are done to the WebLogic through the WebLogic admin console won't be reflected in the stage bits because the stage bits were created by the domain creation scripts not uh, through interactions coming to the limitations of the build pack the build pack can only create a single server instance it cannot create multiple servers nor clusters uh, server to server communication is not allowed uh, only HTTP inbound traffic is allowed no RMA inbound is allowed since the warden containers uh, delete or uh, blow away the containers once a server has exited or has to be restarted there is no state maintained so only stateless applications can be deployed using the web logic build pack for stateful it's better for the stateful to be residing outside of cloud foundry and uh, just a web logic server running on cloud foundry act as a client of those stateful services it can be similarly like if you are planning to use persistent messaging that's not an option because there is no persistent file store even a JDBC store might not work great because a server doesn't have a knowledge of what was its state previously same way for the transaction logs the transaction logs get blown away on server restart so there is nothing to recover the WebLogic uh, server droplet is huge, so it requires a Cloud Foundry release of greater than 158 or higher. Currently, the only stateless applications are supported, as I mentioned earlier. Changes made via WebLogic console will be lost because the stage bits don't carry the changes that you do once a server has come up. Similarly, the WebLogic server logs are transient they get lost at the end of the run but it is possible to redirect the logs to the system redirect the syslog drain endpoints to other services like Splunk so you can continue to save them as well as monitor the logs oh, as previously mentioned on the WebLogic server it would be a single instance the only way to bring up more servers would be to use a CF scale option Currently only WebLogic domains are supported and there is no support for Sova Suite or other higher stacks. Also the security, it's uh, currently using the embedded LDAP. It's, it's possible to tweak the domain to use a external LDAP or other external authentication and authorization providers. Thanks for watching this presentation. Feedbacks welcome.